All right, I think we are all connected here. It's Rick Dawson, and welcome to my first 2011 online training. Coming to you from right outside Chicago here in frigid Munster, Indiana. And that has caused my voice to uh, be a little bit scratchy tonight, but I didn't want to delay getting this training out to you, and I thank you very much for getting here. And uh, you're obviously here right on time, so I know that you're looking to make a few changes in 2011 that will make your business take off or maybe even get started for the first time and learn how to do some deals quickly. And you know the time is definitely right for that, and you're going to have the tools you're going to need right here in this training. And you're going to see how Wall Street is about to turn real estate upside down once again, and not with shady mortgage transactions, but uh, with a more uh, legitimate investment that they're getting very hot and heavy into, and this time right in our neck of the real estate investing game tax sales. So we will get into how that's already started to happen and how we can benefit by being prepared for it as we go through the call. Now in addition to that, we're also going to talk about some new methods and technologies that we're definitely going to want to put into place this year. And here's what these are going to do for you. First, you're going to have a lot more deals to choose from because of this shift that Wall Street has been making. And we'll talk about that near the end of the call. You're also going to know what your profit's going to be on a lot of the deals you do to the penny before you even buy them. And you're also going to be able to buy and sell properties uh, with the system you're going to learn tonight without using any of your own cash. And as a matter of fact, I recommend you only use a minimal amount of your own cash, even if you have some to invest. You know, looking through the questions I got for the training, I'd say over half of them related to funding issues one way or another. And so we'll try to cover that especially well tonight. And finally, the technologies that I'm going to talk to you about um, are going to eliminate a lot of your busy work and keep you doing the high value activities in your business, not that busy work stuff. You know, as a as a mentor of mine says, keep you doing the thousand dollar an hour work, not the ten dollar an hour work. And you know, as a matter of fact, tonight I'm going to turn the whole buying and selling process upside down, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a few minutes. So, all these new developments are going to give us the best 2011 that we've ever had. And that's regardless of whether the market keeps sinking or flattens out or turns around. You know, as you see, it just really won't matter what the market as a whole is doing. Now, I'm getting some people saying they never got their handouts from earlier. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can put these up on the screen here. Got to dig them up. Okay. Any second now on your screen, you should see the icon that would allow you to download that file. Pretty sure I stuck the right one in there. So if you don't have your handouts, go ahead and pull those off the screen there. Just click on that uh, that icon I put up there, and it should put them on your screen. And go ahead and print them out. And I'll give you a couple seconds to do that, and come back to the presentation. Now, uh, uh, while you're doing that, I, we've only got about 60 minutes here tonight, and you know that because of that, I'm really going to have to fly through um, what we're going to talk about. And, you know, I'll tell you the truth, no matter how fast you take notes, uh, for a lot of you, there'll probably be some things you're not going to be able to get down all the way. But uh, don't be frustrated. At the end of the call, I'm going to tell you how you can get a recording of the training for free. And we've actually had quite a few people that couldn't make it tonight already order the recordings for $47. But since you're on the call now, um, I don't want you to feel under pressure while we're on the call. So I'm going to give you the recordings free so you can listen to them again and, uh, you know, review any points that you might have missed or, or wanted to take a second look at. So um, all of you have a link to a website that came along with your confirmation. And, you know, if you tried to go there, you already know it's password protected. But I'm going to give you the password um, later in the call. And once you have it, you'll be able to review the training tonight uh, that we're doing online anytime you like. We'll probably be able to get that posted by tomorrow sometime. So here we are in 2011, and the market has definitely been, let's say, different. <laughs> Actually, really, it's been tough for an extended time now. And, you know, it seems like 90% of the people who make their living in real estate are barely making it, or maybe they've even quit by now and moved on to something else. You know, that, you know, actually, that 90% number is actually probably kind of low. I bet less than 10% of the people you'd ask out there that are involved in real estate would say that 2010 was their best year yet and they they expect 2011 to be even better. Uh, you know, I think most people in this, uh, let's just call them the failing group, they refuse to change to meet these changing times, or they really just don't know the handful of changes they need to make to keep doing profitable deals or do more than ever. And, you know, funny thing is, in that small group of people that are doing well, 
I bet most of them are doing really well. Because the bottom line is right now you pretty much put the right strategies into your business and become a dominant player, probably making more money than you could have a few years ago even, or you don't, and you struggle for every dollar that you make. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's sort of a winner-take-all kind of thing right now in real estate. Either you got it or you don't. And what you'll notice tonight, though, is by making some relatively minor changes from start to finish in what you might already be doing now uh, or in your strategy, uh, including just changing the order of a few of the steps in a typical deal, you can take advantage of the situation almost immediately. We've got one of the lowest levels of competition that I've ever seen out there. So you know, if you're just getting started, you'll learn the steps of a successful 2011 deal right from the start. So when I got started in real estate, it was a down period in the market too. It was in the late 90s and, you know, not quite as uh, crazy it is as it's been lately, but cer certainly nothing great. Um, no easy mortgage money out there. Um, back then you actually had to qualify just like you do now. And uh, let's, see, let's see, you can see on the slide there, there was really nothing special going on in that market in the late 90s. Um, it was really kind of a normal market. It kept up with inflation. Lenders cared about whether the loans would actually be paid back, and they were lending accordingly. So, you know, our perception of what's normal in real estate just got a little thrown off in the recent years. You know, we we didn't realize that uh, it wasn't normal for prices to go up 20% or for us to be able to refinance our mortgage every year and pull money out, you know. We're actually kind of in a pretty normal market again now. We were just so used to how things were for a while there, it just seems like it's bad now. You know, prices, as you'll see in the graph, are sort of leveling out, or at least they're not taking a free fall anymore. And they're finally just about where you'd expect them to be if that real estate boom and bust had never happened. Now, I'm not telling you that because I'm about to make some kind of prediction here about the market. I'm not sure that really anybody can do that, and certainly not me. But the point is we're really not in that bad of a market right now now that we've taken our lumps from that boom from a few years ago. Now, back when I bought my first property, that's been over 10 years now, um, I really didn't have any expectations that, that were set that high. You know, I, I bought this place right here. I was really just hoping to, at a minimum, get it fixed up, refinance all my money back out of it, and then rent it out. And I figured I could just do that over and over again, and someday I'd end up with dozens of free and clear rentals, uh, after I paid all those mortgages off. And, and before I go on, by the way, if any of you are just looking to own property for the sake of doing so or, or to build some kind of future rental empire, please stay on for the rest of this call because I think you're about to potentially make a big mistake there. Um, anyway, back to this property. I got going on the repairs, and pretty quickly the idea of being able to thrive and survive while building this uh, future empire of mine, that kind of went out the window. Uh, things took a lot longer than I'd expected, cost a lot more than I'd expected. Uh, but I did get lucky in a couple ways because when I completed the project, it turned out that that house was worth a lot more than I'd estimated it would be when I bought it. It turned out I was able to get an appraisal for $70,000 where I had counted on uh, no more than 40000 when I'd purchased the property. So uh, second thing I got lucky with, I quickly did find a buyer that was able to get a mortgage. And I walked away with about $15,000 profit, which was great because it was my first deal, but, you know, it really only paid me an average wage for all that time that I spent fixing it up. But, you know, I had done my first deal, I made some money, I learned a lot, and, you know, I at least I walked away with more than I started with. So I figured my, you know, the key to moving on from there was to ramp things up, and, and I did just that. I hired a bunch of crews and started buying three or four houses a month, and trying to move those. So, you know, I was doing all that, trying to scout new properties, doing everything else that goes into running a, a pretty big business like it, it ended up growing into. Um, you know, one thing I did was I was rehabbing these properties in a pretty low-class area, and, you know, as time went on, I I just ventured downward and downward to the worst of the worst neighborhoods, even uh, a lot of houses in Gary, Indiana, which uh, it has some decent areas, but for the most part, it's one of the most run-down towns I've really ever seen, and it's right here in my backyard. And, you know, along the way, I learned a couple of valuable lessons after I made some mistakes. Now, first, I thought the way to make money in real estate was by forcing up the value of it in some way. You know, at that time, by fixing the property up and being patient, uh, leading a, a buyer by the hand, helping them get their mortgage and buy the property. So I didn't really concentrate on trying to find deals that had equity when I bought them. 
you know, deals that I was buying for less than what they were actually worth. You know, what I really did was just went on a shopping trip on the MLS a couple times a month uh, when I needed some new stock, and I usually found something that worked for me within a couple hours of driving around looking and put in a, an offer, and that was it. So you might be wondering why I took so little care getting good deals on the front end, and I guess it's just because I didn't know any better, you know. Um, banks were already starting to lend to people that really had no business getting loans, to be honest. There was there started to be high comparable sales in almost every neighborhood, no matter how bad it was. So my method was pretty much look at the inflated full appraisal value that I'd be able to get for the property, take out my repairs and my profit that I wanted to make, and I was willing to pay what really amounted to an inflated price for the, the fixer product in the beginning. Uh, a price I should have never paid for that if I couldn't have sold it with these these crazy mortgages that were available to almost everyone back then. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that these lenders were not going to be able to continue making these loans and stay in business very long. You know, because it wasn't uncommon for me uh, to see buyers never make a single payment <laughs> on these houses I sold them. And every month it seems like I'd see at least one house that I'd owned before and, and resold hitting a foreclosure auction. And so, you know, it didn't take me long to realize this was a, an unsustainable business model because these lenders would never keep doing this forever. And, you know, that's the problem with a lot of the real estate methods that you see being pitched out there today. You know, at best, they're temporary opportunities. They rely on a temporary condition in the marketplace or a temporary trick or technique. And it's not likely to last long. Now, you know, I really do applaud folks that are proactive enough to try to change the marketplace, invent new systems that have never been done before that, that are, uh, you know, in harmony with what the market's doing. So half that formula is right. I, I don't, I like not to, to fight the tide. Um, and so if the market's down, do deals that work well in a down market. But the problem is, like I said before, a lot of these techniques, they rely on a temporary factor or condition in the marketplace that's likely to correct itself pretty soon. And what you end up doing is you build your business on a foundation of sand. Even if you can manage how to figure out how to pull off this new investing strategy that you learn, you, know, you never know when the rug's just going to get pulled out from you at any time. I mean, as an example, look at short sales. You know, I really can't find any logic for short sales working as a, as a long-term strategy. Now, you know, I may be wrong here because I've tried to do a few uh, a long time ago and they just seem like a nightmare. But to me, the whole principle is to try to get a sophisticated bar party, which is a bank, to take so much less than what's owed on a property. In fact, so much less than the property is actually worth now that you can immediately resell that property for a profit. Now, what's wrong with that? I mean, the bank could take that property back and get as much or more than you're getting if they just waited a few months' time more. So, you know, in order to do this, you've got to rely on an ever-changing, complicated strategy that that's designed to stay one step ahead of the banks. And, you know, I think a lot of those are designed to trick the bank by, by playing with the numbers that the bank receives or, or influencing them. So, you know, I think, I think deals like that are, are a temporary phenomenon that, that are going to sort themselves out because, you know, sophisticated parties like banks, they don't leave a lot of bread on the table for long. And so, same goes for some of these other strategies. They might work for a while now. But when you start to get good at them, I bet that opportunity is already on its way out the window. So do you think these flavors of the week seem like something that will get you in the top 10% of deal makers in, in a market, especially like this one? Well, of course they don't. So back to my story. I saw that writing on the wall when I'd run across houses I just sold for like $80,000 a few months earlier. Uh, coming back on the market is foreclosures for thirty and 40000 You know, In fact... I actually had a friend buy that house I showed you in the first slide after it was foreclosed, and uh, we resold that again a couple months later and made another $30,000 on it. So that, that was great because it was in a hell of a lot better condition than the first time I bought it when we got it back shortly after we sold it. So anyway, the whole lending picture, I just knew it was out of whack in these areas, and sure enough, the banks began cutting back these loans a lot earlier than they did like throughout the rest of the country. I mean, from what I understand, they were still going strong in 2007 and even some of 2008 um, elsewhere. But, you know, by even 2003 and 2004, they were already seeing what a mistake it was to lend this kind of money where I was rehabbing. And it, it became harder to, to make this rehab business work already. So 
wasn't a big deal though because by then I'd already learned some of the fundamentals that I'm going to share with you right now. And when you follow these fundamentals, you don't need a new technique of the week to stay current. You just add new technology as it comes available, and sometimes you change the order that you do things around a little bit. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's start with these fundamentals. and I, They're on page three, I'm pretty sure, of your handout, and we'll fill those in now. Now, as we go through these, I can imagine some of you experienced pros saying to yourself, ah, I already know all these, I've heard all these before. You know, sometimes it's easy to look at a list of things and say you heard of everything and, and lose focus and not pay attention. But you know, the way we're going to weave together a plan with the right properties, the right sellers, and the right process is something that you'll need to have in place to be in that top 10% of investors this year and probably beyond. So let's look at number one. Uh, in fact, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun. Why don't we, we at least already hinted at a couple of these just talking just now. So if you have a guess for each one, go ahead and type it in the questions box there. And I'll get it passed on to me. And uh, we'll, we'll wait like a couple seconds to see, see what kind of uh, answers we get here. So let's look at this first one. Any property you get involved with must, so type your guesses there in the, the text box below. I'll give you guys about five seconds. Just make it really fast. All right, here's one. Must not need repairs. Well, that's not. I guess that's not too bad of a guess. Uh, actually, sometimes it's easier to sell a property that, that needs repairs to a cash buyer for cheap than um, selling like a pretty property to a retail buyer. So... Uh, actually, most of the properties I deal with need at least some repairs. Um, any property you get involved with must currently have equity. That's the answer. So let me explain what I mean by that. We want to be able to resell any property that we buy immediately without having to do any improvements to it, without having to count on the market to rise. We don't want any other factors to have to be present except that we negotiated a price below the quick sale value of the property. And by quick sale value, I mean a price that a cash buyer would jump on. Uh, you know, stop what he's doing and come and uh, buy the property from you immediately. Now, we talked earlier about how banks and other, other institutions like that, really any property owners other than individual people, they're generally more sophisticated and they're not going to keep selling things over and over that are undervalued for long. So, when we're dealing with an owner of a property, like an actual person or, or people, that person has to have equity in the property themselves, a lot of equity, or else they're going to be unable to give us the price that we need in order to work our system. So this right here is the cornerstone of the deals that I've been doing since late 2003, 2004 area there, guys. And it's really pretty simple. Buy really low, sell low, right? The market goes down. Buy lower, sell lower. If the market gets like it did in 2007, put extra paper in your fax machine because it's going to blow up with offers the minute you put properties on the market. <laughs> but if the property, or I'm sorry, if the market gets bad like it is now, it's time to change that process a little more, and we'll get into that. But you simply cannot go wrong by buying at well below the market value, the current market value, whatever that might be, and selling it at or below the the current market value and making the difference, the profit. Now, owners out there will always have real equity in their property, and I don't care how low prices go, because a lot of properties are owned free and clear in this country. I've read that um, a third or more of all the properties in this country don't have a mortgage on them. So let's talk about how you buy so far below quick sale value. Well, we'll get that covered. I wanted to spend a lot of time on that one, because if you don't get that one, at a very fundamental level, then you're not going to be a 10 percenter. I can tell you that right now. So let's move on to the next one. I hope you, you've got that. You have to have equity in the property when you buy, and so does your seller, or they're not going to be able to give you the deal that you need. So as it always was, and ever shall be, you must work with only guesses, cash, no. Working with cash is easy, but we're going to talk about why we're probably not going to want to do that too often. All right, there we go. A couple of people are saying motivated sellers or something similar, and you know that's that's pretty much right. There's a piece of the puzzle as to how we get these below market value deals lined up. The seller's got to be motivated, but you know I'll even expand on that. Motivated, yes, but even better, indifferent. You ever you ever run into an indifferent seller? They're even better than motivated sellers because they don't have a lot of emotion about the property. 
and you'll meet some real attached, emotional, motivated sellers, and they, they can make the deal a little more difficult if they don't want to let their property go, if it's really special to them. But you run into indifferent sellers, they are really the best. They don't even want the property. You're probably even doing them a favor by getting it, get, getting it out of their hair. Maybe they never even wanted it, and it was thrown in their lap, or maybe they had such a hassle or bad experience with it. They've already moved on in their own mind. And when we find these kind of people, um, we act on them. Now, this is the kind of thing you're going to find a lot of people who inherit unwanted properties or people that made a bad investment, and now they've kind of gotten over it and moved on. So uh, we're going to find a lot of those in the system we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> I really hope my voice is going to hold up, but I am going to keep going here so that we can get this information out to you tonight. So let's look at the next one. Now, if you're not getting these in advance, don't feel bad. I'm realizing I kind of didn't give you too good a clues here, so I'm not sure I could get these myself unless I'd written them. <laughs> All right. Take advantage of ever-improving technology to blank, allowing you to blank. All right. You don't have to guess this one because there's probably a lot of different ways of saying it, but one advantage you can always have over everyone else is to use technology to do some of these mindless tasks that really don't take a lot of real estate skill, but can, they can take up a lot of your time if you don't automate them. And, and you know, when you do that, you can focus on the $1,000 an hour work. And you know, you know what that really is? That's putting together deals. That's something you can't really uh, have a computer do for you is negotiate and put together deals. And later on, I'll show you some ways to use technology to get your leads, to market to them, and even close your deals. This is all t top 10 percenter stuff, guys. And you're going to be blowing everyone away if you can spend all your time just getting deals done instead of licking envelopes or or talking to sellers with no equity or putting together short sale packages that end up getting rejected, all right? So let's go to the next one. Beware the, and there's another one that's going to be hard to get, but we already talked about it. Beware the flavor of the week real estate investing technique. This is the quickest way to get burned out in real estate or really any business, you know? As you guys can tell, I'm also in the internet business. After all, you know I sell courses, and I'm on a training with you right now online. And I'll tell you what, if there's an industry that's more racked with flavors of the week than real estate, it's got to be the make easy money on the internet game. And, you know, knowing not to listen to this flavor of the week from my real estate days, that's really helped me with my training business as well. And, you know, fact is a failure in almost any business can be traced back to a lack of fundamentals and not because you are missing some magic pill. Now, if you're employing the fundamentals and still struggling, know that you're probably only a few tweaks away from starting to see some real progress. Now, have you seen a lot of top earners in a business doing something totally different every week, and, and every time they just press a button and, and money just pops out of it? I know that. I sure don't. All right, how about number five? Don't try to create equity where there is none. We talked a little bit about that. You don't want to try to force the price of a property up so you can squeak out a profit. You don't want to use some crafty method to get somebody to overpay for a property so you can make a profit. Work with properties that have plenty of equity built in. All right. If there's liens on a property other than mortgages, sometimes you can easily deal with those. And I'll make a little exception there. You know, let's say you find a lien that's nine years and ten months old that's set to drop off in ten years. Okay, well, you know what to do there. You could, you could buy the property and wait it out a couple months. There's other techniques to to dealing with certain kinds of liens, but generally don't tr you know don't struggle trying to squeeze blood out of a turn up you know a property that has a, a a mortgage that eats up all its equity. Start with a nice juicy, free and clear tomato, and uh, you'll be a lot happier. All right, last one here on this page: true or false? One of our biggest goals for this year is to make our phone absolutely ring off the hook with desperate sellers. <clears throat> See what you guys think about that one. All right, well, almost everybody is saying true. And, yes, we did say we want to spend our time doing deals, and we even said a lot of that will be on the phone. But, you know, this is kind of a, a, a trick question here. The answer is false. We don't want our, our phone ringing off the hook with desperate sellers if they have no equity. And if we don't focus on a group of owners that we know is likely to have equity, we're going to be wasting a lot of our time talking to owners with no equity. So in general, with this market downturn, I'm seeing that 90% or more of, of so-called desperate sellers uh, have no equity. That's why they're desperate. So 
to me, general advertising for motivated sellers without any kind of screening um, is not a top 10 percenter kind of idea, um, at least in, in the situation we're in now, here in 2010. So those are some of our fundamentals. And I can't imagine that any of you, if you're, if you're reasonable, would disagree with any of those, as long as you were able to find deals regularly that fit into those conditions, right? Well, I'll show you how to do that here in just a few minutes. But let's up the ante and add two more fundamentals that I don't have here on the sheet. And we're going to require these of all of our deals in 2011 and maybe for uh, the near future after that. Now, we used to be able to get away without these because the market was so hot, but now we're really starting to need them. So let's add another fundamental. You might want to just write that on the bottom of your sheet there. We want to invest little or none of our own money into deals now. Now, I always thought you had to have cash to be in the real estate game, especially when I got started, or at least be able to qualify for a mortgage um, so that you can get a property paid for. And, you know, for years, that's exactly how I did things. I paid cash. Or I got mortgages for probably the first hundred properties that I bought and rehabbed. And, you know, I couldn't wait to the day where I could easily just plunk down 30 grand in cash for a fixer and save all the time uh, dealing with banks and loan applications. But, you know, that never happened while I was rehabbing houses. Uh, so that was a, that turned out to be a pipe dream. But as I started working with these indifferent sellers who had equity in their properties, once I learned about this technique that we're talking about tonight, you know, sometimes I'd carelessly get into these marginal deals because I did have some cash to use. I didn't feel like negotiating anymore. I just wanted to, you know, notch another deal. And, and over time, I realized, you know, there's no legitimate reason to have cash in deals about 95% of the time. And the one exception might be if you needed cash to stop some kind of foreclosure like today or tomorrow and the property has a ton of equity. But if you don't have cash available, you just work on other kinds of deals besides these last, last minute uh deals that have to be done within like 24 hours. And you know, looking back, we've done relatively few of those anyway, where we don't have at least a few days of breathing room to get a deal done before a deadline. So after a while, I saw that putting my own cash in the game was not where my value came into play. You know, there's, there's, believe it or not, there's tons of people out there with plenty of cash on hand. So you're really not all that special if you're only, you know, the only thing you're bringing to the table is that you can write a check quickly. Your skill, as you're going to see here tonight, is learning to be in front of the right seller at the right time and at the same time having a cash buyer for that property ready to go. And that leads into the second additional principle for 2011. We want a higher degree of certainty to our deals. Now, nothing in life is guaranteed, uh, definitely not. But with this market unpredictable and certainly not poised to take off again like a, like a rocket, we want to do everything we can. Um, to take a lot of guesswork out of things, all right? Um, we're never really going to know what the final selling price of a property that we buy and, and close on and go to resell is going to be. But there's some things we can do to get our facts together up front, all right? We know what we've negotiated for a property, and we're going to know what our buyer is willing to pay before completing the deal when you set up the deal like I'm going to show you later in the call. Then if we can't find a buyer, or if the buyer that we found backs out, the deal just won't take place on the front end, and we can either renegotiate or we can move on to another deal. And this way, the only way the market can affect us is to keep a deal from taking place, but it can't, it can't cause us to incur losses or uh, anything else like that, and we've lost nothing but just a little bit of time. So with all those, we are up to eight fundamentals now, and most of them relate to the actual deal itself, like property needs equity, um, yet the seller must be motivated. Those are, those are kind of uh, running opposite there, but we'll talk about that. We can't rely on a new technique of the month to, to get us through. Uh, we're not going to try to force a deal by improving a property or manipulating um, our seller into overpaying. Or, 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 I mean, our buyer from overpaying, or our seller for that matter. Um, we don't want to weed through 200 sellers manually on the phone to, to find a, a possible deal. We don't want to use much or any of our own cash, and we want to know for certain, if possible, that we can make a profit before we even complete a deal. So that is a pretty tall order, I will say, and uh, you must be thinking it's like, trying to find a needle in a haystack to get a deal that meets all those criteria. But you know, that's hardly the case. And I bet you've guessed where we're going to find these deals right now, right at our county building. 
And of course, we are talking about a property with delinquent property taxes. You know that's my game. You've been following me for a while, I'm sure, and you know I would end up here, right? But I'm just getting started. By the time we're done tonight, you're going to see how to profit from tax sale property in a completely different way than most people, a way that meets all these fundamentals that I, I just explained and puts us squarely in that top 10% bracket that we want to be in. Now, you already know that I never bid at tax sales if you've, if you've read any of my materials. Yeah, I never do that as a primary strategy, even when the times are good, and I'll, I'll review why in a minute, uh, but rather... I always deal with the owners of the delinquent property before the tax sale. And we're actually going to flip our normal buying process upside down almost. So we'll get to that um, as one of the process maps in the call. But first let's talk about why tax delinquent property is the source of properties that we're going to use to get these deals done. And there's so many here, I hope we have time to talk about all of them in sufficient detail. But I'm going to try my best when we get down to the the last few, we might just have to kind of run through them. Uh, but there are so many things that make a tax delinquent property a perfect candidate for us to uh, employ this system, okay? Number one, and this is probably as important as all the rest combined, it usually has big equity. And you know that likelihood goes up as the tax foreclosure approaches, and so does the owner's willingness to work with us. You know, I'm always asked, how do you deal with mortgages when you run to end properties? And you know the answer is, I usually don't. By their very nature, tax delinquent properties don't have mortgages on them in most cases, especially as time goes on. So let me show you why. Now, first, as you know, most properties with mortgages have the taxes paid by the lender directly. And even if a borrower stops paying the mortgage, which plenty of them have been lately, lenders usually continue paying the taxes. And why is that? Well, they're going to have to pay the taxes at some point in the future, so they don't want to pay late fees and everything else that goes along with uh, making late tax payments and they they're going to have to catch that up because they don't want to risk losing their mortgage and that's exactly what would happen if the property went through a tax foreclosure the bank's mortgage would get wiped out so generally they pay the taxes regardless of the loan status so they're going to pay those taxes regardless of whether the buyer or the, the borrower is paying on his mortgage or not now what about those loans that don't have escrow you know where the buyer just pays the principal and interest and uh, to the bank and then they pay the taxes on their own. Well, you know, there's actually quite a few of those mortgages out there now because they were, gen they were uh, originating a lot of those during that uh, crazy boom time a few years ago. Well, one thing you got to realize about the tax sale process, almost every state requires several notices to go to all parties of interest in a property when taxes become delinquent. So, in other words, when I say parties of interest, I mean that they have to be sent to the owner and the bank as the taxes become delinquent. And not just one notice, usually at least three between the first delinquency and the actual tax foreclosure, usually much more. <clears throat> so the bank finds itself in the same position as before. They can step in and pay the taxes for a relatively small amount, or they can lose an investment they've made, the mortgage, which is worth a much, much larger amount. So in the overwhelming majority of cases, that's exactly what they do. Once again, they pay the taxes, and then they can start a foreclosure on their own so they can at least get the property back. And, you know, as time goes by, the banks receive more and more notices. Maybe sometimes they'll initially give the owner a chance to, to pay the taxes, but uh, by now they've usually come in and paid the taxes when we're entering the late stages of the game. In addition, they have whole departments that just check up on all their assets throughout the country to see if there's delinquent taxes. So fewer and fewer mortgage properties are seen at the later stages of the game. And what does that mean? Well, it means all the properties that are left at the end, for the most part, are free and clear of mortgages. And no mortgage almost always means high equity. Now, the properties sometimes slip through the cracks. Of course they do. Banks sometimes misses the, miss the notice. Or, you know, with all the transferring that the banks did, a lot of things got out of whack with, with selling assets to each other. And it happens. I mean, I'll even show you an extreme example here I ran across the other day. I laughed really hard, i got to tell you. This bank actually didn't pay the taxes on its own branch, and the branch was sold at a tax sale. So <laughs> I think that's funny stuff. It goes to show you any property of any kind can go through a tax sale if the taxes aren't paid. You know, when property slips through the cracks and it has a mortgage, we'll just tell the owner to get with the, their bank and try to figure something out, and we'll move on. It's really not a big deal. So that's one of the main reasons that we like tax delinquent property. It just keeps getting better and better the closer it gets to 
the tax foreclosure deadline, and that's why it fits our first fundamental perfectly. It's got equity. Now, another reason that we run into a lot of indifferent or motivated sellers, we'll run into them almost from the time that we first see delinquent taxes on a property. Because, of course, the first sign that someone's let a property go is they stop paying the taxes. And their property appears right on our tax delinquent list. Now, you know, in the early stages of delinquency, there are still a lot of folks that aren't motivated, they're not indifferent, they're just a little late on their taxes, they're really not prospects for us. So we need to screen our lists pretty carefully if we're going to work with some early stage tax delinquent lists where people are just like one installment late, let's say. We might want to deal with just out-of-state buyers at that, uh, sellers, excuse me, at that point. Come up with some other criteria um, that will allow us to work those lists earlier and, and not spin our wheels. Okay, but things really heat up when a property becomes three, four, five payments delinquent and it approaches a tax foreclosure deadline of some type. Now, each state's procedure is a little different, but regardless of the procedure, all properties end up at a drop dead date at some point. So we'll look at our chosen state's process and then we'll map it out so we know exactly how that works and when those deadlines occur each year. In some states, they occur uh, weekly. So just depends. Now, the amount of properties will start thinning out because most of the owners will, will pay the taxes by the time we get to the end. Or they'll have sold the property conventionally or the bank will have stepped in by then to pay off the taxes. So by the end, pretty much everybody is motivated or indifferent or, or they better get motivated uh, or they're going to lose their property. Now the indifferent sellers, they are ideal because they really don't care about the property. Now, if we miss them earlier in the process, we will identify them a lot more easily now that that list is thinned out. Now, maybe they're lo you know maybe they're looking to walk away with several thousand dollars from a property, or even a more significant amount, ten, twenty thousand. Others, they're just so indifferent they'll give you a deed to the property if you just give them some money for their time to sign it over to you. Now, another question I get: Why would a seller act so irrationally about it? Why wouldn't they just sell the property for God's sakes? Well. One big reason is that there is an inheritance involved with the property somewhere in the past. That's something I find in common with so many properties I run into. The, the, uh, the person we're dealing with either never completed the probate, even though they're entitled to the property, it never got put in their name, or they just never felt the sense of ownership that the person that gave it to them did, and the, the heir hasn't paid the taxes on a perfectly good property. And then, you know, some people, to be honest, they just weren't meant to own property. I just can't explain it any better. That They're not responsible enough to own property. They never would have owned property if this property hadn't fallen in their lap. And so they've gone on and, and grossly mismanaged it. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the time they had to work with the property to, to disappear on them. And, you know, as the pressure mounts, a lot of them will just bury their head in the sand and, and they'll wait for this so-called problem to disappear. And either we'll make it disappear and give them some money or the county will make it disappear and take their property. So I've noticed that over 80% of the deals I've done though inher uh, involved in inheritance somewhere in the past. So that's an interesting interesting point. Now, you know, and then you'll get, you know, you also get, that's not, that's not all of them though. You'll get people that have struggled with the property for years and finally just kind of had a breakdown and, and <laughs> just, for, you know, want to forget about it. Or maybe they bought it as an investment, they never did anything with it or things never worked out. Either way, they've just had it. They want to get rid of it. So why don't the people just sell the property themselves before they lose it to taxes? Well, I'll tell you the answer to that. Almost everyone does, okay? Most people are pretty rational, and if they see this coming, six months, a year out, they will sell their property. That's great. But we're dealing with the exceptions here. We're dealing with the, hap the you know situations that should have never happened, but they just do anyway. And they always show up for us neatly right on that delinquent tax record list or the tax sale, the final tax sale list that we're going to request from the county. So those are two huge reasons for working tax delinquent property. Probably enough reason right there for it to be a great source of properties for us. But let's go through a few more really quickly. Now tax delinquencies and, and tax sales, they're pretty cut and dried. And let me explain what I mean by that. There's almost always a firm deadline at some point and you can find out if the taxes have been paid just by asking the county. There's no backroom negotiations that you're not privy to, like like you'll see with a mortgage foreclosure. Um, you can routinely update your list to see who's paid, so you can concentrate on what's left. Um, and you know, 
the states are just a lot of them are governed by laws that require that tax sales are run on at certain times and and they have to do them so another one is all these taxing authorities they're governed by public records laws okay mortgage companies they don't have to tell you anything about a property but governments they have to tell you they have to give you a list of all tax delinquent properties just about any time you ask along with the delinquency how long it's been delinquent the amount owner information all the other things that you're going to need in order to analyze uh, to preliminary look at the deal at the beginning filter it out and get a hold of the owner all right another thing as time goes on we're getting these lists increasingly electronically that means you can generate they can generate them almost instantly and they can be sent by email or CD and then as I said filtered on our own computer very quickly leaving us with just the best leads um, what else a lot of counties are required to deal with your request for these lists by mail or email so you don't have to travel there uh, you don't have to travel either to your local county or any remote county where you want to get leads I'm starting to see more and more third-party vendors too that also sell tax sale lists electronically and keep various records that you're going to find very useful and I bet that will only increase as time goes on all right there are thousands of tax delinquent properties in just about every county at any given time so there's always plenty of deals to work on and you know as I said before tax sales are in most areas are run on a pretty regular basis so there's a predictable cycle and you know since taxes are one of those things uh, as they say that are inevitable um, people that don't pay their taxes are inevitable too and new delinquencies are going to be created every day and kept track of you uh, kept track of for you by the government quite meticulously actually so pretty cool arena to be in there lots of things going for us to really make a system here that that we can use so I hope that's enough to, to get you a little bit more excited I hope I've actually got you convinced so let's wrap up by tying everything together and how we're going to make this happen so let's look at those process maps at the back of your handout so let's take that first one there and you can fill in the blank this is actually sort of a little uh, a process map for working tax lien sales and that was a big question I got um, from the survey that we did how do you buy at tax lien sales how do you buy at tax deed sales well I already told you we're not going to do that but let's talk about why and then we can contrast that to the system that we're going to roll out tonight all right now at a tax lien sale you don't buy the property itself most of you probably know that you buy a lien against the property only you don't own the property at least until later so basically you buy the you buy the taxes we call it here in Indiana you pay the taxes on behalf of the owner and potentially you earn interest on that investment for a certain period of time that the county uh, gives the owner to catch up the taxes and that's called the redemption period and if the redemption period runs out you're then eligible to obtain a deed to the property if you haven't been paid back in most states so let's look at that process first step is research research on tax lien lists can really be overwhelming believe me I know because we have big tax lien sales right here in my own county and in our state and you know at the time tax liens are sold in a, in a lot of counties there are still a ton of delinquent properties um, that that are offered that's because the redemption period still ahead and a lot of the owners don't feel a big pressure to pay their taxes yet so there can be thousands of properties on that list to research and in my county lately there's been over 10,000 at a lot of the recent tax sales uh, tax lien sales and you can't skimp on research because a high percentage of the properties on a lot of tax lien lists are worthless they're little slivers of land um, they're just other properties that aren't even worth the taxes that are owed and you know in the example I just gave you only a little over a thousand properties out of the 10,000 were sold so that tells you most of those were worthless and needed to be screened out so you're going to be doing a lot of traveling uh, not only to visit the properties that you might bid on but also to the courthouse because you're going to want to check aerial maps to make sure you're buying the property that you think you're buying and doing other various research there so that process is really a significant burden and if you don't do it correctly you can buy a worthless lien and lose all of your investment all right so that's the research in a nutshell really quite major for uh, most tax lien sales and if you're going to be making a career out of this you're going to be traveling to many tax lien sales each year so lots of work on the front end there 
So next, let's go to step two. That's the sale. And here's where you need the big bucks. If you want to make any real money from tax liens, you're going to have to buy a large portfolio of them. There's just really no way around that. Now, yes, they usually pay 10% interest or, or even more. But as you're starting to see, this isn't really a passive investment, okay? There's a lot of work that goes into buying liens correctly. So, you know, even if you made 20% a year, to make a decent, even a half decent income of 50 grand a year investing in tax liens, you'd have to have a quarter million dollars in play at all times, all right? So if you have that kind of money that you want to earn high interest on, tax lien investing might very well be a great choice for you. But otherwise, there's just too much work to, you know, dabble in it in a small way. You know, you can't go do all that research and invest $2,000 at a tax lien sale. You're going to make $200 in interest or have a a long shot at getting a property, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, it's just not worth all that, that work you got to do. Some other factors at the sale, too. You really don't know which liens that you're going to get a chance to buy because there's going to be some kind of auction method employed, you know, either bidding process that you'll bid down your interest sometimes and reduce your return or bid up what you pay for the lien. Or, you know, at a minimum, there's going to be like a round-robin distribution of the liens to the buyers because a lot of buyers are going to want the same lien. So there's some uncertainty with what you're going to end up with and what liens you're going to have the chance to buy. So you have to be prepared to buy a lot more different liens than you'll actually end up walking away with. So you've got that time and travel factor with the sales as well, uh, although a lot more of them are online now. Let's move on to step three, the waiting process. Ugh, if you're investing in liens for interest, this is great. you got your money parked. You know, In fact, the longer they go in a lot of cases at high interest, the happier you are. But I'm guessing most of you are looking to obtain properties like I am. And you know, bottom line here is 95% of the liens that you buy are going to pay you off if there's a good property backing that lien up. Now, I told you earlier how the list thins out as the final deadline approaches. Well, owners and mortgage holders see that you've purchased a lien on their property and that you're getting close to foreclosing. They're going to almost all pay you off before the deadline. So, how do they know you've purchased a lien? Well, because you've paid an attorney additional fees up to $1,000 or even more. He's going to do a title search for every single lien that you purchased. Those are getting expensive now. He's going to send notice to every lien holder on every property. So, yes, these fees will be reimbursed to you if the lien's paid off, but it's more money out the door along the way that a lot of people don't count on. And imagine the bind that you could find yourself if you ran short on money after you invested a, everything you had into a tax lien sale and, and you couldn't pay for the, no, the noticing, that'd be that'd really be a problem. And you know, during the redemption period, it's really hard to plan because you never know when you're going to get paid off or if you're going to get paid off. You don't, you never know if you're going to end up with any properties until that redemption period has come and gone. And once that deadline's up, if you still have unpaid liens, uh, we'll move on to the next step. Time to send your lawyer some more money. Have them go to court for you, wait for your court date, and get a tax deed issued. And you know, at that hearing, your noticing could be examined. And if it wasn't done perfectly, you could be denied your deed. So lots of lots of intricate processes there. So let's say you got your deed. That's great. Um, get your checkbook out. <laughs> Send your lawyer some more money. You're going to have to evict any occupants that are in that property. This is another unappealing part of buying properties right from a tax sale, uh, at least for me. I don't like the idea of forcefully taking somebody's property from them. So, finally, you're ready to sell, right? Uh, not yet. Now you got to do what's called a quiet title. And this is a final court action that will clear the title of the property completely, and every title insurance company requires it. That can cost you several more months and another $1,000 or so. Now you get to sell the property. And you know, with any luck, you estimated that value correctly on the front end of the property. You paid much less for that lien uh, than, than the value. The condition of the property hasn't gone downhill over the years that you've held the lien. market hasn't changed in the wrong direction drastically. You know, occasionally you can make a huge profit on a property that you get from a tax lien. That is for sure. Um, I've seen tax lien buyers in Chicago get $300,000 properties, and they've only had like $20,000 invested. So it's truly a windfall. But, you know, it's exactly that. They had to buy millions of dollars worth of tax liens. I'm talking millions and millions of dollars worth to get that rare outcome there. 
So tax lien investing is interesting. It's got its points. It can be great for a person who likes to be active in the business and who has a lot of money to invest to make everything worthwhile. But investment's got a long duration. It's unpredictable. And <clears throat> if there's one thing it doesn't do, it does not provide quick cash by any stretch of the uh, imagination. So let's look at the second process map now. Now this is the process map, you can write it in on the top, for buying a property directly at a tax deed auction. Now in a tax deed auction, you'll typically go to the sale, you'll bid, and you'll get the property free of liens right away. Um, there's also something called a redeemable deed auction, and that's really just like a tax lien auction if you ask me, because the owner still has time to pay you off, it works kind of in the same way that a tax lien does. So. We're talking about like a, a, a final tax deed auction sale in this part. And you know, it sounds good on the surface because you get the property, like I said, free and clear. And those minimum bids are nice and low usually, just about uh, the amount of what was due in taxes over the span of a year or two. So uh, beginning steps are, are sort of the same. You're going to do the research process. Um, if you're going to bid at the tax deed sale, you're going to have to check out each and every property that's on the list once again and see if it's something you're interested in buying just like you do with those liens. and um, You know, I forgot to mention before, and this is true of both, the tax sale list that you get from the county is usually not all that detailed either with either kind of sale. So sometimes all you get is a parcel number, a legal description, minimum bid, some minor, you know, just some bare bones information like that. And it really tells you very little about the property. So you're going to have to really enhance that information to see what you want to buy. So there is research involved here too, but it's not nearly as much. And... The reason why is, like we've been talking about, it's the end of the road for the owner, so sort of like the redemption period we just talked about running out, most people tend to start paying by now, and the list gets a lot smaller, a lot more manageable by the time the end comes. So, you know, again, you're going to need to physically visit any property you're going to bid on, that takes time, uh, and if you're going to make a career of this, you're going to be traveling around a lot of different counties, trying to get to know a lot of different markets, um, but overall, something I could live with so far. But the killer comes next, the competitive bidding at the sale. Now, just about any kind of public auction that I've ever seen, it's going to bring the price of a property to at least the quick sale value, and that's not going to leave us any room for a profit. And, you know, furthermore, I've seen people get auction fever. You know, it's just a part of the human condition, I think. Bidders will bid these properties to full retail value. I've even seen them bid them higher than retail value. And, you know, there's an example of someone trying to throw their rate around using their money because they have it, uh, instead of having a real strategy and, you know, really being pretty foolish uh, just buying properties because they can, you know. So the opportunity of tax deed sales pretty much starts and then there and ends there, if you ask me. Um, I think it's really difficult to get a good deal at the tax uh, deed sale because, like I told you before, there's a lot of people willing and able to pay cash for a bargain, and so these bargains really effectively get eliminated by the bidding. And, uh, but you know, like everything else, exceptions and anomalies happen, and you might find a property everyone else missed and didn't bid on and, and get a good deal. Um, I heard, I hear about people that get good deals because uh, they like to write in and say, Hi, I got a deal at a tax deed sale. You said that could never happen. Well, I get a handful of those, but it's not a way to, to build a, a successful business, okay? Um, the properties do start at attractive minimum bids, like I said, so. <clears throat> Um, if you do happen to find one that, that was overlooked and you get it, good for you. But then you follow a similar process like you do at the end of the tax lien investment process. You got to, you know, wrestle away the ownership and the possession from the owner if they're still on the property, including an eviction. Um, you have to see if the interior of the property is as in good a condition as you hope because you wouldn't have been able to see it before you buy. Still have to do a quiet title. Still have to resell. Um, I really, honestly, don't know how people use tax deed sales as a, a primary way of doing business. So if you wondered how to make money fast at tax deed sales without any investment, now you have your answer. It's not really possible as far as I know. And that's why we're going to take the alternate route shown in the last process map. In fact, it's a completely, doesn't even really resemble the, the first two. Uh, but before we do that, let's touch on a couple other tax sale angles that are commonly available and we've had a couple questions about, okay? Uh, how about over-the-counter sales? Now, as that name would suggest, these are properties that you can buy over-the-counter, um, pretty much on demand at your county, and for like a minimum you know, price kind of situation that the county will set. Uh, usually you don't have to bid, so that all sounds good, but you know the reason these aren't something we focus on 
they're properties that nobody bought for the minimum bid at you know one or more previous sales. So they're either worthless or they've got a, a relatively minimal value. Um, you're hardly ever going to see any kind of house or improved property where that improvement has any salvage value left to it. Um, I've heard some people doing nicely with those when when the county will drastically reduce the price that they'll take for the property just to get it on the tax rolls uh, after it's been sitting a while. Um, I've heard of some guys buying lots for, say, $800 a piece and, and ending up getting a few thousand dollars a piece for them when they resell. So you could look at that, but it's really not a primary strategy either, and it, it's one that, that totally doesn't work in, in my area, I can tell you that. Another version of that is second chance auction for tax liens, sort of like the same thing. Sometimes the county will offer tax liens that weren't sold previously. They'll slash the price, and most importantly, they'll cut that redemption period down, sometimes as low as a matter of months. So that can be an occasional op opportunity for uh, for the right person. So you still have some of those negatives. You're going to have to do all the research. Um, you are going to have to still do all that legal work and whatnot, but you won't have to wait out a long redemption time, and you might get a good price on it. So you'll probably, be, you'll probably end up with lower-end property, um, and that's going to be restored to its full tax rate. Don't forget that. They're giving you a big discount now, but it's going to be restored to the same tax rate that, uh, that sent it to a tax sale with no buyers before. So beware. So just wanted to mention those two because some people were asking about it. Certainly not top 10% material there like we want. You're going to be fighting for just a little scrap of advantage over everyone else that's trying to do things the regular way. So let's look at number three. Now you've got most of the picture now. I've told you we need to deal with owners before the sale, and I gave you a lot of reasons why. And even if you knew that we dealt with owners before the sale, I hope this has jogged your, your memory about why this is such an exciting field to be in, area of tax sales to be in, just because of all the factors we have working in our favor. Um, and I'll even give you more reasons why as we go through this. And, and here's one right off the bat. How about the research? Remember all the research we just talked about you got to do for tax liens or deeds? You know, possibly thousands of properties. And that's almost completely eliminated when we work with the owners because we're just going to filter out our list to the very best owners we can. We're going to just use a few easy factors like assessed value and any other information that we might have. And incidentally, when we get these lists of tax delinquencies, um, <clears throat> they, they typically have a lot more information than a, a typical tax sale list. But bottom line is we're really only going to worry about the property itself only when we have a favorable conversation with the owner. We're not going to uh, research each and every property on that list in advance like we have to do if we're going to attend a sale. Okay, And even when we do research a property, we're going to leave it up to someone else most of the time. And I'll show you why in a sec. So let's get over to that uh, third process map. We're already almost running up on 60 minutes here, uh, so let's 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 really run through this now. Now, what's our first step going to be? It's not going to be to find properties or research properties. It's going to be to find buyers. We need to have buyers lined up before anything else because we don't want to do all the work to get a good deal and then have to scramble for cash buyers in the area and end up losing the deal. We want to shop that property around immediately to cash buyers as soon as we have a contract on it. And you might be wondering, where are we going to get cash buyers today? Well, they're there just as much as ever. The only difference is they're going to demand a good deal on the property more so than ever. Now, if you don't believe me, look at some of these latest news articles showing these record turnouts uh, and bidding at tax deed sales. So, I mean, here's the kind of news stories that I'm seeing all over the country about this bidding. I mean, tax sale turns into a bidding war, the headline on September 24th in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, which isn't a especially, uh, I don't know, optimum place to invest even. Foreclosure auction shatters record. Buffalo, New York, staged its highest revenue-producing foreclosure auction in city history this week, October 28th, 2010. Bids totaled nearly six million, shattering a previous record set in 2008. And this year's tally is impressive, given the fact the number of properties on the selling block was at a four-year low. So isn't that strange? Clark County reaps four million from a tax sale. Nearly a hundred people looking to buy the lot next door, purchase an investment property, or expand on the, the amount of land they own crowded into a government building Monday. But I think this one says it best. Lean sharks set a record. Investors surface looking to cash in on tax sales. Even in a sour economy, there are apparently plenty of folks looking to make a buck. A record number of investors turned out for this year's annual Gunnison County Tax Lien Sale this past Thursday. I think that says it all. You know, whether we're in a bad economy or not, 
there are still people that are looking to turn out to make a buck, and if you can give them properties that allow them to make a buck, you're in business. So imagine how happy these bidders would be to have you call them up before the sale, offer them a couple properties that they were about to go and bid on, that they could get right now at a bargain price, and you know what? They could even avoid those quiet titles and evictions, and best of all, the competitive bidding. They are going to love to hear from you. Pretty good deal for them, and great way for you to get in and out of a deal. So we said we'd go through this step by step, and I almost ran through the whole thing just now. But let's go to step two. We're going to deal with the courthouse a little bit, and we're going to get the tax delinquent records. We already talked about that. We're going to spend a little time filtering our list so we don't pursue, uh, you know, obviously properties that we don't want. But this isn't really a big time waster because we don't have to travel to the courthouse to get records. We can get them in spreadsheet format, a lot of times by email, and we'll filter them with our computer, our spreadsheet program, and we'll arrive at a list that we're ready to mail to. And this is not a long or, or lengthy, expensive process. Speaking of expensive, notice so far I don't have any dollar sign symbols on this process map, and that's because what we've done so far has been free or, or very close to it. Now, if we want to be efficient, spend a bit on mailers to the delinquent owners, we'll get those out. And <clears throat> if we want to uh, prioritize, save on mailing, we can mail to only the best owners, maybe those that have an out of state address or show their mailing address as something different than the property. And we'll get some calls from those mailers, we'll do some deals, but some great deals have come from calling out to the owner. Sure, you'll get deals from owners calling you, but we're really mailing for a different reason. We want the return mail that's going to come back to us. So then it's time to put on the trench coat and do a little investigating. This is really fun sometimes. Um, from our home computer, using horse, uh, resources on the Internet, we're going to find a good amount of owners on our list uh, who we got return mail for with just a little bit of effort. And you know, guess what? You can use social networking like Facebook now to find a lot of owners or somebody who knows them like a relative. Uh, you know, a lot of people are attached at the hip to Facebook, it seems like, and, and more and more are joining every day. So it's really becoming a great tool for finding people you're looking for. But I digress. Uh, we're really on the hunt for the indifferent owner, and we've come to the right place. Uh, we're going to find one, and we're going to talk a little bit and see where they're coming from, what they'd like to do with the property. Sometimes they're just finding out now for the first time that the property is about to be lost. That happens to us all the time. They had no idea anything was even going on. They might have even forgot about it. Now, if they've truly walked away or given up on it, and we like our chances of reselling the property, we'll go ahead and risk maybe up to 100 bucks or less. We'll get the deed right away, get them out of the picture, and that's kind of outlined in the process map in the lower right. Uh, and then we'll let our cash buyer list know about the property and hope for the best. If we can't sell it, then we're out the 100 bucks. So if we're not willing to lose that, we'll go for the the other uh, the other process in here. Uh, and more often. If, especially if we're working outside of our area, that's what we're going to do. We're going to negotiate the best price we can, and we're going to get a contract signed with the seller. And, you know, we're not going to sweat the price all that much at this point. Although, if it's obvious the seller's stuck at some crazy high level, then we'll, we'll let it go. But if we think there's potential, we'll get the best price we can, and we'll get the contract signed. And we'll let our cash buyers know that we have this property available right now with no bidding, no waiting, no quiet titles, no evictions. And, and that we're in a really good position to give them a bargain on it, and we'll let them check it out. We'll let us know uh, what they're willing to pay. And with any luck, we've secured a profit, and our, secu our, our, our certainty of closing the deals uh, just went way up. We already got a buyer that's willing to pay more than our contract price. Now all we've got to do is arrange the assignment of that contract and get our money. Now, if we can't get a sales price higher than what we negotiate with the seller, you know, we'll still make a final offer for several thousand dollars less than the, the offer we got from our buyer, and we'll see what happens. You'd be surprised if the if more time has gone by and the seller's not getting any action. They'll often reconsider when they see that uh, this might be the best chance uh, and the last chance before the sale. So that's really the process, and uh, I really have to apologize for making you wait so long to see what all this is to do with Wall Street, but I'm going to let you know now. Uh, although. <clears throat> Although you got to be excited about the strategies I've already given you. Uh, and I'm going to try to make it through with my voice here, uh, really starting to get a little hoarse. But it turns out Wall Street has now regrouped after that mortgage fiasco they started. And they've begun investing in mass in tax liens. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been pumped in in just the last few months, a big increase over before. And I'm sure you know that Wall Street has access to practically limitless amounts of investment capital, especially for 
an investment that pays double digit returns when you know bank accounts and, and mortgages are returning one two three percent or less and you know the thing is not only are they sending people to bid on tax liens one at a time at auctions they got the capability of buying out an entire county's delinquent tax obligation in one big transaction and that's what they're starting to do and you can imagine why this is attractive for a, count, a county you know just to take care of it all at once um, have totally predictable revenue and not have to bother with a sale so a lot of them are trying to go that direction if, if it's allowed so why would this cause a wave of free and clear foreclosures? Well, all this extra capital is going to flow into the system. It already has started to, sending a lot more people into tax foreclosure and even earlier. And in areas that have bidding, that increased activity is going to make it much harder for owners to redeem that higher redemption amount that's going to result. And starting to see outcry all over the place, uh, like this story here, at the horror of how many more how many more people are going to lose their properties because of this. But let's look at it as a great opportunity for us to do a lot more business. Now, we're already, I believe, well over the hour mark. I hope I, hope I got you excited. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you, there's not a magic fairy that's going to fly into your, your tiny one-bedroom apartment, as uh, Don LaPree used to say, and, and transform it into a mansion with a Lamborghini outside uh, all before you wake up tomorrow, okay? Nothing I can give you is ever going to do that. But you already know life doesn't work that way. And neither does that process I laid out for you, okay? I put together the only system I know of that allows you to find all the owners of high equity property that, that you could ever handle. And many of these owners, better yet, don't even want their property. And you can match them up with cash buyers that you've already generated in advance. I've told you, tax deed buyers, th th they, they're the best cash buyers you could ever wish for. But you know, it's not magic. You're going to have to do some work. And to get some of the best deals, you're even going to have to call some sellers or have someone... Uh, call them for you like I do. Uh, and if you're the kind of person that says they want success with, with real estate but you're not willing to put any effort in, you know, what I'm about to offer you here is definitely not for you. Uh, and one other thing I want to be clear on, you're not going to get $200,000 houses in, in perfect shape for $168 free and clear like you see in those infomercials. But you're certainly going to be able to work with properties at any price level because you're not going to be closing on most of them yourself going to be working a system that has everything going for it that we talked about at the beginning of the call. It's got all the features that we're all looking for. Low investment, low risk, high equity properties, motivated or, or better yet, indifferent sellers, and really high volume anywhere you go with ready access to the sources of information that we need. So if you're ready to profit from this wave of free and clear foreclosures that's already starting to build, and I'm talking about being a 10 percenter now in 2011, I put together a package just for attendees of this call that's going to get you there a lot faster and easier, and it's my brand new free and clear foreclosures training. Now, the core of this system is my twice weekly online coaching sessions, eight in all, where I'm going to cover every detail that you're going to need to start getting quick results. Now, each one of these eight video-based sessions are going to come in two sections, an absolutely step-by-step, what-to-do-only section, an action section. And then a comprehensive explanation section. I know you're going to want both, but sometimes you just need to cut to the chase and take action. So that way you can cut right to the action steps on any module that you wish. And what I'm going to do this time, instead of doing one long video for each section, I'm going to break the sections into short videos and label them so you can easily get right to what you're looking for almost immediately. So this training is something I've never put out before. You'll be the first to ever take it. And for callers tonight... Uh, it's valued at $1,997 just for that part. And the next thing you're going to get is access to all 50 of my Instant Expert State Guides. Now, I've already done all the research for you on every state's tax sale system, both the delinquency system and the final disposition of properties um, at a tax, uh, tax deed sale or tax lien sale. I've mapped out where you want to come into the picture in the process to, to contact the owners. And in addition to quickly getting up to speed on each state's timeline, you're also going to get an analysis of the exact tax records that are kept by each state. And I've already identified exactly what records you'll need to request and when, so you can ask for them by name. This information is going to give you complete freedom to either work your own backyard or anywhere you choose in the country. It'll allow you to work year-round, uh, whether a, a tax sale is being held or not. These manuals sell for $47 each, making this package worth $2,397. Now, you're going to be getting big lists from the counties. I've already told you that. And you'll want to filter a lot of those lists for the out-of-state sellers 
for the assessed value range that you're looking for. And my DGrever List Wizard is a Microsoft Excel program that will do all this for you. And in addition, prepare your list for mailing and much more, regardless of the, the format that the list starts out in. It comes with a separate training guide, and it's $197 value. Now, remember we said that one of the first things we do is get our cash buyers? Well, that's what you'll be doing in no time with my Instant Cash Buyers module. Now, here I'm going to provide you with everything you'll need to get tax sale buyers lining up to avoid bidding and waiting by buying your properties before the sale. You're not going to have to wait for the next tax sale and visit in person either. I'm going to show you how to get lists of tax sale buyers directly from the county that they have from past tax sales. And this also means you can get quick buyer lists anywhere you decide to work in the country with the system. All right, this includes all the letters, scripts, and emails that you're going to need to get started right away and even to notify your buyers when you get properties. And in addition to this source of cash buyers, I've included four easy, low-cost, additional free sources that you can use to keep your buyers list stock besides tax sale buyers. This is a $597 value. It comes with a package when you register today. Now, in the online coaching sessions, we're going to show you how you can send mailers inexpensively using the Internet. But before long, you're going to be getting a steady stream to return mailers, and this is where a lot of exciting deals start with an owner of abandoned property. And you're going to receive my secrets to locating missing owners videos as a part of this package. Well, you'll learn how to use free Internet resources and social networking sites like Facebook to track down owners of tax delinquent properties right from home. And we'll even cover some professional-grade paid resources. This is a $397 value, and it's yours today in the package. Now, you'll discover in the video coaching modules also that hardcore negotiating skills aren't really necessary in this business. We're going to be targeting a group of owners who might not have even realized their property was about to be lost to taxes after all. So I'm going to give you just a simple formula for making offers and all the paperwork you need to get them signed off in my free and clear legal forms package. I'm also going to show you how to set up assignments with your cash buyers so you can get paid on your deals without even taking ownership of the property yourself. This is an $897 item that comes in the package. Now, I know you're going to want to jumpstart your process of getting started and cut straight through to the action steps. Um, you're going to also get my free and clear foreclosures quick start guide. This written guide is a no-fluff blueprint. It'll take you start to finish very, fin uh, very quickly when you get going. It's a $97 value. And finally, along with your coaching sessions, each week you'll get my quick start summary video to go along with your coaching module. And these are perfect to watch on the go on your iPod, and they're $197 value. So let's go over all that real quick again. You're going to get the twice-weekly online coaching sessions. You're going to get all 50 Instant Expert Guides, the Instant Cash Buyers Module, Secrets to Locating Missing Owners, the Free and Clear Legal Forms Package, and the Quick Start PDF and Video Series, all as part of this training. And sold separately, that's a value of $6,482. And as you're going to see in a minute, just one successful deal could earn you many, many times that amount. But I'm also developing some awesome bonuses for you as well, which you'll have access to after you register. First, you're going to get Instant Cash Buyer website. This pre-built site is going to allow you to capture contact information from your cash buyers that you find using the cash buyer system so that you can build your list anytime, day or night, whether you're available or not. And I'll also share some techniques to attract cash buyers directly to your site. This is a $997 value, and you'll receive it during the course of the 30-day training. On the other side, you'll get your own instant motivated seller website as well. Some sellers are more comfortable getting started with you with email or using the Internet, and this site will collect and store your seller and property data for you. It's a $497 value. Now, with those bonuses added, I bumped the value of the package now to $7,976, and it is everything and more that you'll need to get started on deals right away. Now I want to show you real quick how a couple of my students have been doing with tax delinquent properties over the last few months. Now in case you didn't catch this audio bite I sent out today, listen to how my student Jim did after getting started in Pennsylvania recently. Notice he had cash buyers at the ready when he did his first deal, something that he figured out on his own, and he got his property resold fast for a huge profit. Where I'm from, that we have a, they give you a list before the sale, before the tax sale. Okay. So I just sent letters out to the um <clears throat> to the owners on the list. I just sent it straight to their address, you know, and then got quite a few called callbacks because they were motivated to sell and um the one the one he was he called me back and I looked at his property and he owed about six 
six thousand dollars in taxes, but his property was going to be sold in a month. So, okay. So I I uh, looked at the house. It was didn't need anything. It was in perfect shape, and he had um, moved. He knew that it was going to be sold at the tax sale, so he moved to an apartment and didn't need anything. So I said, I'll give you fourteen thousand dollars for the property, and you know it was a it was worth eighty. Eighty to a hundred thousand. Um, so the guy just moved that. out, huh? And gave up on it. Yeah, he gave up. You know, he owned it free and clear. <laughs> wow, that's that's super. Uh, other so, than the back taxes, so all right. Yeah, he owned oh. it free and clear. He had an insurance claim, so he paid. When he bought the house, he just paid cash for it. Um, I paid. I paid him fourteen thousand. Um, and then, but that he got. I, I, there were six thousand out on taxes, so I. You know, I gave him eight thousand, and I gave the tax. You know, the but I had a buyer's list, so I had already sold it for fifty nine thousand. Um, awesome. Now, if you get a few deals under your belt, you might want to take on a monster deal like Chip did. I just heard about this one today. Let's look a little bit about what he said. Now, he was kind enough to send an entire background of this deal, and I'm not going to have time to go through it all right now, but let's read a little bit here. Some background on myself. I've always looked at ways to get ahead, but none ever panned out, but I followed their systems, and I busted my butt to no avail. I have no college education, but a great work ethic. So what do we talk about? That's important. I have what I consider average intelligence. I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 28 years. I have three kids. We've always lived in a nice house, had nice things, financially done okay, but I've always wanted true financial security, so we've always looked at a way to achieve this. I've been a home builder for 30 years with mostly good years until recently. All right. So I summed up his deal here. He said, I located an out-of-state owner that had four 40-acre parcels that were at risk of being lost within about a month to go. And in the end, I had $37,000 into this land, and with all my costs, I sold it all for $104,000. So my profit for my very first deal was $67,000. I mean, that's incredible. Now, I have to say, Chip didn't just push a button and have $60,000 fall in his lap. His email talks about how he had to work with the owner's estate to get his get them to first accept his offer and deal with some issues with the county because while the state was considering his offer, they allowed the redemption date to pass. But the point of the story is with a little bit of work and, and persistence, Chip got this property closed on his first deal, and this wasn't a, uh, just an open and shut first deal. He sent it out to an auction company, got an offer for 104000 and made 67000 So that's what these are the kind of deals you can have to look forward to once you get started. All right. So guys, this is a system that you've been asking for. The one that's going to allow you to get started doing deals just about anywhere in the country with high equity property, motivated sellers, and we're going to get started with this training in just a few days. Now, I'm going to close registrations by Sunday at the latest, and I'll, I'm going to offer a version of this package to the public if we don't fill the training tonight. It's going to sell to the public for $1,297 starting Saturday, and it's not going to include everything offered in the special package tonight. But for everyone on this call who pre-registers now, you're going to get the training for only $997. All right, the special price is only guaranteed for tonight, so click the button on your screen now to secure one of these 37 kickoff spots in the training. Or head on over to www.deedgrabber.com slash FC for free and clear. That's www.deedgrabber.com slash FC. You can also order from Michelle on the phone, if you like, at 800-528-9149. Now, if you call the order and the line's busy, leave your name and phone number to secure your spot in the training. And she'll call you back tonight if it doesn't get too late or tomorrow at the latest. you want to secure that spot, though, because in case we fill up tonight, um, that will be it. And also, the first 20 to order are going to get a complete physical package of this training once we're done with it at no extra charge. So, guys, we already ran way over here. I am barely able to talk, but to start getting deals like Chip and Jim did and the ones I've been getting for almost 10 years and do some of these new deals where you don't even need to use any cash or credit to get started, it's time to be decisive. I can set you up with the perfect way to do real estate deals now, but I really can't make you act. Only you can do that decision and get started. And, you know, as always, I'm willing to guarantee your satisfaction with this system for a full 30 days. If you don't feel it's the most effective possible way to do easier and more profitable deals, you can just request a friendly refund. So really like to thank all the people I'm seeing ordering now. And, you know, this has really been a great business for me over the years. Um, I like to show this slide here and, and talk about how thankful I am this business came along and brought me from struggling with 
rehabbing houses to moving in a nice place uh, like I'm in now, having a lot of free time to travel, even restoring my old car, my old car that I, I bought when I was 15 years old. Um, we're even heading back to Hawaii right after this training uh, and spend another week out there. So I'll just leave you with this. Just think, 30 days from now, you'll at least have put some of these steps into action, if not already started lining up deals. And your seller and buyer websites will be collecting leads. You'll be matching up buyers and sellers. And, you know, what about 90 days, one year from now? You could really see some major changes in your life by then, especially if you have a success, even one success like Chip or, a Chip or Jim did. So I'm going to sign off here now. Grab your spot in the training at dgrabber.com slash FC or call Michelle at 800 800- 5289149 to get going now. And <clears throat> I promised you a password to the uh to the password protected site where you can get um, unlimited reviewing of this webinar. And go to that URL and use the password Wall Street 2011 all lowercase. That's Wall Street 2011. So we're going to kick this training off early next week and you'll have access to some of the materials even before then. I am so looking forward to getting your success story. Order now at deedgrabber.com slash FC or 800-528-9149. Well, I think that's about all my vocal cords can handle, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me tonight, and I will see you in the training. Good night.